Hello, welcome to today's session on alchemical free energy calculations. Uh, my name is Bert de Groot, and together with Vitas Kapsis, uh, we'll be in charge of the um, of the session. We'll start with um, um, a talk from my side on the general concepts, and then Vitas will take over and give you a number of in-depth examples of what one can do with these kind of calculations. And um, after that, we'll do some hands-on um, calculations, um, computing uh, alchemical free energies ourselves. So why are we so interested in uh, free energy uh, calculations? Well, um, if we think about affinities, for example, um, of a, a drug binding to a protein or also of protein-protein affinity, uh, these are uh, free energies of binding. Um, also, if we think of stabilities, um, so yeah, how does the stability of a protein change, for example, upon mutation? This is also about the free energy, in this case, the free energy of folding. Um, also, if we are interested in rates, yeah, so for example, chemical reactions, uh, conformational transitions, these are also determined by free energies. In that case, it's about the free energy barriers. Um, and, and the list goes on and on and on. So free energies are where, uh, really a, a central thermodynamic quantity that we're interested in if we're interested in, in different aspects of, of biomolecular function. And as a small bonus, um, it turns out that free energies are actually frequently more tractable in, in simulations than other thermodynamic quantities. And um, so that's very useful. So how does this all um, fit in? Well, of course, due to their central importance, there are many different flavors of free energy calculations. Uh, and this is just an, um, a, a broad but not complete overview of, of different states. So we have um, um, purely statistical methods. Those can be ligand-based. So this is the realm of chem informatics. can also be structure-based. We have hybrid methods. Perhaps you've heard about methods like Rosetta, for example, that uses a statistical force field. Um, there's also methods like MMPBSA, um, uh, which are somewhat based on simulations, but then also um, make um, a sort of a regression model so t um, uh, to, to make some shortcuts, basically. Or one can also go the completely first principles based. Um, so this is based on the first principles of statistical mechanics mechanics and again there's different sub flavors of those so um, um, if one is lucky you can just do a, a plain brute force MD simulation and then um, do the counting of the probabilities of states that you encounter and the free energy is um, uh, is, is nothing uh, but a probability we'll get to that in a second uh, but frequently we're not so lucky and then we need to bias our sampling. Uh, and um, you've already heard about uh, methods like metadynamics. Um, uh, and but today the focus will be on the so-called alchemical methods. And um, I'll tell you all about how that works. Now, um, why don't we just um, take a textbook and look up the definition of the free energy where we will find that for example one definition of the Gibbs free energy is simply the, um, this one which is probably very familiar to, to you which says there is an enthalpic contribution and uh, a minus TS term which is the temperature minus an entropic um, part and this would indeed be a, a valid way of computing a free energy unfortunately this is also very difficult because obviously one would need to have access to the enthalpy. Well, you could say we have energies from our simulation, so that should be easy. Well, it turns out this term is, is difficult to converge, and this term is even more difficult to compute frequently because um, enthalpy, uh, entropy is, is, um, is a beast. So um, what can we do about that? Um, well, like I said, if we are lucky, we can just um, you know, have a very long, free, unbiased simulation where everything that we're interested in already occurs spontaneously. Say, you know, a ligand is binding and unbinding from the protein of interest. We simply count how frequently it's bound and how frequently it's unbound. 
And then this Boltzmann relation here tells us that this probability of finding the state, so say the bound state or the unbound state, is directly proportional to its free energy. Um, so that's very simple, that's very useful, um, but that's also, um, um, yeah, it depends on us seeing everything spontaneously. And this is, as you know, we have the sampling challenge in, in molecular dynamic simulations frequently, which makes it the case that this um, Boltzmann formalism is not always applicable. And that's why we have this whole range of alternative methods as well. Um, just to make this point even clearer of how free energies and, and probabilities are, are related or actually one and the same thing. So here we look at a peptide that is in the course of a simulation constantly uh, unfolding and refolding over and over again, uh, just um, by chance. And um, what we can see is that um, at room temperature it's mostly in the folded state, so it has a low deviation from the experimental folded structure. Um, but at higher temperatures, so at the more or less the melting temperature, it is more or less 50-50 populated in the unfolded and folded state. And from that we immediately can say, well, if the population is 50-50, then you know, also the free energies of the folded and unfolded state should be very similar, right? Because equal or uh, similar probabilities means similar free energies. Um, and of course, this is the case. Um, so we can make good use of that and, and define the free energy exactly directly based on this probability. Um, then you get um, a sort of a heat map like this. So here the um, color codes for the local density, so for the free energy of, of a particular state, and we see these different states emerging. And if we look at, at um, um, each individual structure, then of course we don't have a distinction like here, either um, folded or unfolded, but it could be anything else as well. Um, so um, here, for example, we have the folded structure as indeed the densest or um, therefore the lowest free energy uh, cluster, but we also have this very similar cluster which is folded on the N-terminal part of the peptide but not on the C-terminal part. And then we have this very um, different structure that also has a, a sort of a, a relatively low free energy, uh, but it's a completely different fold. And then we have all the unfolded structures uh, together um, that also have um, a low free energy, but we can already appreciate here that this is um, um, not one state, but you know, these are very different structures, all of which count together as the unfolded state. Um, this is just another way of, of representing the same data. Um, so again, um, we have the um, um, uh, free energy computed from the um, local uh, probability, but now uh, we haven't only color coded it, so from um, uh, blue as low free energy now to red of high free energy, but we also use it as the vertical axis, whereas on the horizontal axis we use one of these um, um, conformational coordinates that we had used before as well. Um, and this representation actually nicely shows the effect of temperature also. Yeah, so if we are at low temperature, then we see that um, these low free energy basins are um, uh, more occupied, whereas at higher temperature, we see that um, um, entropy kicks in. Yeah, that's this minus TS term that we were talking about before, um, which makes that the unfolded state becomes, uh, makes a larger contribution and um, the system doesn't feel these minima as so um, attractive anymore. But like I said, the, the, um, this is all very nice, but it depends on us sampling all the relevant states um, spontaneously. And unfortunately, that's not always the case. So that's why it um, frequently makes sense to think about alternatives and alchemical free energies um, 
uh, is is uh, often um, an an interesting choice, and I'll try to convince you of that. So um, let's consider the following process. So um, say we're interested in the binding of a particular ligand to a particular protein. And we could say, well, um, we have everything we need to look at the binding um, free energy. Yeah, we look at the bound state. Um, it has it will have a certain probability. Uh, and if it um, you know, does undergo spontaneous um, um, binding and unbinding, we can just look at the probability of being in the unbound state. And then the difference between those two will be the binding free energy, fine. Um, and from the um, probability of, of being in the sort of intermediate state or from the uh, on and off rates, uh, we actually also get an impression of the barrier of the, the, you know, that the free energy barrier that is um, 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 separating the bound from the unbound state. Um, and if it doesn't happen spontaneously, well, then we can always apply something like umbrella sampling or metadynamics to make this process happen, right? So one could say we have everything uh, we need, so um, job done. Well, this is true, um, but um, one may also realize that uh, we spend a lot of time in this whole process of binding and unbinding, and particularly if this barrier is high, this can become quite problematic and costly. And then we may also realize that if we're only interested in the difference between um, the bound and the unbound status here, and, and we're not so interested in the well, the actual binding process or the free energy barrier separating them, then we're actually spending most of our computational effort in, say, umbrella sampling or metadynamics in this in-between process, whereas we're actually only interested in the difference between um, the end states, yeah, the bound and the unbound. So can't we do something about that? Well, yes, we can, um, because we can um, consider this binding and unbinding process like we did before and say we do that for one particular ligand um, and um, say we're um, not just interested in the affinity of that ligand but we're actually more interested in seeing if this other ligand which is somewhat related is a better binder or a worse binder so yeah if, if the binding affinity for this blue ligand is different from that of the green ligand. Now, um, yeah, so one way to go about that would be to compute the umbrella sampling metadynamics free energy for the green ligand, get the delta G binding for, for ligand A. Um, you do the same for the blue ligand, you get the delta G binding, ligand B, fine. Yeah, and that will give the difference in free energy between the two if we just subtract those two. And now the alchemical idea or approach is, well, we could also do the following. We could just transform ligand A into ligand B, once in the unbound form and once in the bound form, and compute a free energy for that um, situation. And now the nice thing of thermodynamics is that this thing will have to close. And if, if it doesn't matter if we would go from here to here to here, we should get the same answer as if we would go from here to here to here. So free energy is a state variable, so the answer we get should be path independent. And that means um, uh, the difference between these two that we were interested in must be the same as the difference between these two that we can compute by these alchemical transformations, yeah, transforming ligand A into ligand B. Um, and um, so if that is a, a simpler process, um, yeah, this alchemical transformation, then this unbinding binding transformation, then we have actually gained something. And it turns out that this is frequently the case, so that these vertical lags are much more um, accessible than the horizontal lags of the cycle. That means we can just 
compute the two alchemical transformations, uh, once in the unbound, once in the bound state, subtract the two, and we get exactly the delta, delta G that we're interested in. Um, yeah, so that's what I said. Yeah, we can use an alchemical approach yeah, like free energy perturbation or thermodynamic integration, for example, to, uh, to sample those alchemical lags. Now, how does that work? Um, one approach there uh, that is that is commonly used and and um, yeah, one of the first to have been um, employed is thermodynamic integration, um, where we define a coordinate usually called lambda, um, uh, which we define to be zero for our state A, so our blue ligand, and um, we uh, define this coordinate to be one for the B state. And then um, uh, one can write down this equation for the um, free energy, which is an integral uh, um, over lambda um, of the uh, Hamiltonian um, derivative with respect to lambda. So uh, for the physicist uh, among you, this is like a, a force acting on this lambda coordinate. Yeah, so we just take the derivative of the of our Hamiltonian with respect to lambda. So this is our energy function, and uh, we compute that in every step, um, and then do a simulation in which we start from lambda equals one. We slowly transform it. Um, sorry, we start with lambda equals zero, then we transform it slowly during the simulation to lambda equals one, and uh, at each step we. Um, uh, compute this derivative, integrate over it, and this is our delta G. Um, and yeah, we could do this gradually during the simulation. Um, this is um, uh, uh, called slow growth thermodynamic integration. We could also stop at different points and there um, collect and average our um, derivative that is called discrete Ti. It all comes down to the same thing. And yeah, so this is a valid and popular approach for uh, computing alchemical changes. Um, some thing to think about maybe in the um, uh, in the meantime, and, and happy to discuss that afterwards or during a coffee break, is um, we see that we take the um, derivative here with respect to our energy function and we call that delta G. Um, whereas, you know, previously, uh, let me just briefly go back. Uh, you may remember this formula here, um, where we said the free energy has an enthalpic component and an entropic component. S and um, yeah, where now we just have this energy related term and um, you know, integrate to that and I call it the delta G. So um, is that justified or yeah, wh where, this, where did the minus TS term go? That would be the question. So is it neglected? Is it included? Um, um, happy to discuss that. Um, another approach to achieve the exact same thing is to um, use free energy perturbation. It's based on the same principle. Um, lambda coordinate uh, 0 for A, 1 for B, um, but we use a different formula and that is um, we only simulate A and um, take snapshots from that and um, recompute the energy of that snapshot for the B state. Um, so um, uh, that is what this equation means. Um, this uh, these these brackets I should have mentioned that before those are ensemble averages so this is averaging over a whole ensemble and if it says ensemble A it means we have simulated ensemble A so we've just only simulated the A state at lambda equals zero but we don't only compute the energies of state A but we also for each snapshot compute uh, what would have been the energy if we would have had ligand B here. Um, and um, yeah, the 
so-called Zwanzig formula tells us that um, evaluating this expression also gives us delta G. We could have simulated also state B, of course, and then um, done the same thing backwards. Now, this works very well if our A and B states are very similar. So in phase space, that means um, um, yeah, uh, there is sufficient overlap. And um, this is usually the case if there's only a small perturbation going from um, A to B. So say you want to go from a phenylalanine to a tyrosine where you just uh, change a um, hydroxyl group on an amino acid, then this may work uh, well. But of course you may wonder you know, if the A simulation state is not representative for any um, states that the B state would have visited, then this of course is not going to work very well. And this is exactly what you would see in, in deviations or a bias in your um, delta G. So what you can do then, of course, is just define some intermediate states, so at um, you know, different uh, intermediate lambdas, and um, um, redo the whole formulism, um, and uh, yeah, get your answer from that. And be aware, of course, that you sum all these free energies, and therefore you would also suffer from error propagation, so to if you need many intermediate states, you typically get larger error bars. Um, so yeah, of course, there are some uh, pros and cons for each of these flavors. Um, there is um, uh, for for TI, um, there may be um, uh, only, uh, sorry, FEP is here on the left. So for FEP, uh, it may be very sensitive to the choice of lambda step. Yeah, because we have this. Um, exponential um, terms here that can be quite um, numerically sensitive. Um, um, there is some some um, um, simulation time lost due to equilibration, and yeah, I already mentioned this this exponential averaging. Um, for that reason, TI could be considered more robust. Um, but what you get, of course, if you do it in the slow growth approach, is that every time, every simulation step, you change lambda, and the system may need some time to to um, um, adapt to that. So you could suffer from some Hamiltonian lag, uh, but um, you don't suffer from this exponential averaging. So uh, that's an advantage. Um, right, um, and. Yeah, the, the, the same trick that I already explained for the ligand binding and this alchemical transformation, you can apply in different contexts. So here's an example from a thermodynamic cycle applied to protein stability. So if we would be wondering how a mutation is um, changing the um, stability of a protein, then of course the question is, so how is the um, uh, folding free energy changed? Well, experimentally, you would look at the folding-unfolding equilibrium. Uh, you would do that for the wild type. You would see, you know, say, a certain uh, unfolding temperature. You would do the same for the mutant. And then you would see, okay, is the mutant more or less stable than the wild type? Here we can apply the exact same trick. Um, we can do the mutation alchemically, so transform one amino acid into another, and we do that once in the unfolded state, we do that once in the folded state, and um, we then subtract the two, and this is exactly the same as the difference that we're interested in. So again, with an alchemical transformation, without ever sampling an unfolding folding transition, yeah, which may be cumbersome, um, uh, we, we don't need those transitions anymore. We can just um, look at the alchemical uh, free energy change due to the enforced mutation. Okay, um, now this is how the status of the field was until maybe something like 10 years ago. And so everything I told you so far assumes that um, our simulations are carried out in equilibrium and at each lambda state also we first need to reach an equilibrium and then sample states from that equilibrium. And um, so that's the classical 
um, statistical mechanics way of defining free energies. Now, um, s with the advent of non-equilibrium methods uh, by by uh, people like Jarzinski and Crookes, we can actually also make use of non-equilibrium simulations. So that means fast transitions going from A to B, uh, and nevertheless um, extract free energy calculations from that. And how that works, I can uh, explain in a, um, uh, in a second. So um, what we do here is the, the same formalism as what we have seen before with thermodynamic integration, um, uh, but um, uh, with one important difference. Um, so what we do instead here is we have a, um, um, a long simulation for state A, and this is just a plain um, normal MD simulation, and we do the same for um, state B. So here in this example it's called wild type versus mutant, but it could also be ligand A versus ligand B, for example. Um, it's the same principle. Um, and what we do then is we do fast transition, so fast meaning just picosecond timescale, in which we apply this trick of changing lambda, so in this direction from zero to one, but we so we take snapshots from this equilibrium ensemble um, where lambda is, is defined as zero and we then uh, apply this trick of taking snapshots and then uh, switching lambda to one in just a very short time. And vice versa, we do the same from um, the B state, we collect snapshots and uh, switch lambda to zero, starting from that. And then uh, we apply the same formula as, as uh, what we've seen before already for thermodynamic integration. So we take the derivative of our Hamiltonian with respect to lambda um, and compute um, um, the integral going from uh, uh, lambda going from zero to one. Um, note that here I don't call the result a delta g because it isn't. Um, it's, a, it's a work value. Yeah, and it's not a, a free energy in this case because we move so fast that in addition to the free energy change, there may also be some dissipated work. Yeah, you um, know that, for example, if you uh, move your hand through water, um, yeah, if you do that very slowly, then you almost notice no resistance, but do you try to do it very fast, then you, you m notice the friction of the water and you have to apply more and more force and, and therefore more and more energy to move your hand from A to B. Well, the same applies here. So in addition to the free energy, we also have dissipated work because of friction and that um, uh, uh, also contributes to our work value. But now the very nice thing is that um, we can get rid of this, um, this dissipated work again by, for example, the Crookes fluctuation theorem, which says that these distributions of work values, um, uh, if we yeah, look at the work values in the forward direction and we look at the work values in the backward direction, they have this very nice um, relation that um, they actually are connected to the delta G that we're after. Um, yeah, and if we just look at the you know, probability of finding um, a forward work value. So that's the blue distribution. Um, and it's related to uh, finding the same work value, a negative, um, in the reverse direction. This is, um, um, you know, the, the those two probabilities are related to, um, uh, to the delta G. And there's one special case yeah where these two probabilities are equal so meaning uh, that's the place where these two distributions overlap um, so it's where they cross um, that is the estimate of our delta G yeah if, if this is the two distributions have equal probability then this is one um, meaning that you know uh, if e to the power something is one then this something must be zero so meaning that uh, W must equal delta G. So at that point, we have 
um, um, reached our delta G. And so this is an actual way to estimate free energies, and it's a very powerful way, yeah, because we can just spend almost all of our simulations in the states that we're interested in, so the actual physical state of the system, just do a couple of short um, um, non-equilibrium transitions to connect the two, and we know the free energy difference between them. Um, this is just um, one particular example where we can see this at work, um, so from, from actual uh, simulation snapshots. So here we took a snapshot from two equilibrium simulations that were 100 nanoseconds long. We took a snapshot every nanosecond, I think, and each of them led to a work value from which we built um, uh, this distribution. And um, yeah, we can estimate our delta G as exactly where these two distributions are expected to cross. Right, so let's have a look at some applications. Where can we put this um, into practice? And obviously one, one area of application is drug design. Um, and this, is, this was one of our very first applications where, where Vitas looked into thrombin inhibitors. So this is thrombin, uh, the protein, and we see one particular ligand bound here. And there has been you know, uh, an extensive experimental study where lots of different modifications were made to this ligand at these locations um, marked in green, uh, and for which experimentally affinity changes were measured. So how these modifications at these locations change the affinity of, of those um, ligands. And those were exactly the same um, modifications we also applied in our simulations and computed a, uh, or estimated a free energy change for. Um, here actually the thermodynamic cycle we used uh, was slightly um, uh, different. Uh, but it, it's um, based on the same principle that um, we've looked at before. So we are uh, interested in a, um, in a uh, bound state and an unbound state. We modify the ligand. So here we add an additional purple group to the blue ligand. And uh, we make that tr alchemical transformation once in the unbound state. And yeah, we don't need to simulate the protein in that lag because you know it's not bound anyway. In the bound state um, we simulate the complex and, and um, uh, introduce the same modification there and um, yeah apply the same trick that you by now know. Um, we can actually do it all in a, in a single simulation box yeah so we can have the two legs of the cycle, the bound state and the unbound state in the same simulation box, which is useful sometimes. Yeah, for example, if we are looking at charge changes, then we um, uh, avoid any changes of the total charge if we uh, put the both systems in the same box and, and move in opposite directions. Um, um, uh, but yeah, you get the overall idea. And these are um, the results that we got. Um, so in yeah here we just have a, a bar plot of the um, of the set that we were looking at so in cyan you see the calculated value and in orange the measured value from itc um, this is our reference ligand and yeah you see the modifications here so some aromatic groups um, um, were changed at the different locations, uh, some other modifications, methyl groups added, and so on. And um, yeah, um, overall we see quite a favorable agreement. So frequently if the you know, simulation says that um, this is a worse binder, then also the um, experiment says that. And sometimes there are uh, di differences as well, sometimes even qualitative. Uh, but yeah, this is about the accuracy that one can expect. As yeah, so we here we have a scatter plot of one versus the other, so computed versus experimental. We see an overall quite favorable agreement with correlation of something like 0.8. Um, so that's um, 
um, yeah, nice to see. You also see these these dashed lines here, which is a, a deviation of um, uh, one kcal per mole. That is sort of the gold standard in the field, and uh, we typically reach that with these kind of calculations. Few are higher, but on average we are uh, within that ballpark, meaning that um, yeah, that's about the accuracy of of the of these type of simulations currently. Another example I want to briefly show you, and this is the last example I want to share before we hand over to Vitas, is um, an application in in uh, uh, on protein mutations uh, where we try to design a functional change into a protein. And for that, uh, we looked at the protein ubiquitin, um, which we see um, here depicted as an solution ensemble so this is ubiquitin free in solution where it um, you know adopts different conformations um, and when we started looking at this we realized that you also find many instances of um, ubiquitin in the protein data bank uh, and actually in many of these instances ubiquitin is bound to something else yeah? and and so it's it's available in many different protein complexes and in each of these complexes you typically find uh, ubiquitin in a slightly different conformation. So the first thing we asked is, okay, so are the conformations that we see free in solution, do they have anything in common with the specific conformations that ubiquitin needs for, for specific complexes? Well, um, the answer is yes. Um, so this is a principal component projection of um, uh, the solution ensemble uh, that we have here in red and a set of X-ray conformers in black. So if you don't know how a PCA works, um, it's important to note that each dot here is a single structure, so it's in a single ensemble member and each yeah, black dot, for example, is one X-ray structure, and uh, PCA looks at um, um, largest fluctuations. So the single largest uh, collective motion uh, is actually depicted here in this movement. It's a what we call a pincer movement. So it's ubiquitin opening and closing, and so we see that in some crystal structures, yeah, the the black ones here on the right side, um, uh, they are in a more a closed state of the system, yeah, so where the spencer is in a more closed state, and um, uh, whereas other complexes apparently require ubiquitin to be in this open state. And in the solution ensemble, we see um, both open and closed states, meaning that um, you know, all of the required states that ubiquitin needs to, to engage in complex formation are already sample free in solution, uh, which is one prerequisite fulfilled for, for conformational selection. Um, so that was the first thing we found. But then we thought, well, um, so apparently this native wild type ubiquitin can um, you know, undergo this opening closing motion all the time. So could we think of um, a mutant of ubiquitin that would be locked in either a more closed state or in a more open state. Um, yeah, so, uh, and if that's the case, would it change its binding behavior? Yeah, so then it might not be compatible anymore with, with um, uh, uh, structures that require the other state. Um, uh, well, first thing to know for that is, of course, um, yeah, what we saw here for uh, fluctuations in the in the free state um, uh, is that um, different in in uh, in the bound state? Um, yes, it is. So um, yeah, although in some cases it doesn't matter. So it, this is this the same projection as before. Um, but uh, we always compare uh, the free state in in red, which is always the same, to different bound states or different complexes. Uh, in, in blue, so every blue cloud is a different complex, and we see in some complexes it doesn't matter, so it, it's ubiquitin is also free to open and close, but in some it's actually 
restricted in either a um, um, closed or in an open state. So those are the interesting ones, right? Because if we now would have a, a, a mutant ubiquitin that we could lock in either open or closed, then we would expect that we can change something to the preferences of those complexes because they would not be uh, compatible anymore, possibly. So this is basically the idea. Yeah, The native ubiquitin undergoes this constant opening and closing and can form complexes um, with um, uh, states that require ubiquitin either to be in a closed or an open state. But what if we can mutate ubiquitin, say to be only or mostly available in an open state, then of course these complexes would be uh, would readily form and, and we would not expect any major difference there um, but the situation would be different for these because here we would expect a large destabilization. Well, um, yeah, we tested this um, with an alchemical screening so we did many many mutations, over a hundred and to make a very long story short we found a handful um, that would be predicted to be open stabilizing. Yeah, most mutations don't have any shift in the preference. Um, but we also found a handful that were um, uh, predicted to be closed stabilizing. So, um, yeah, now it becomes interesting to see what they do to the mutants. Well, um, here are the ones that uh, we would predict to be compatible. So where, yeah, the um, basically in, in this, um, along these lines, so where we would not expect any change. And then, yeah, we also have the category, of course, where we do expect a change. Um, so, where we don't expect a change, um, uh, we, we see almost no effect on the uh, affinity, so meaning a um, difference in affinity of close to zero. This is another control group. Uh, where again, uh, except for one outlier maybe, we see values close to zero. But these are the ones where we expect incompatibilities. And in fact, uh, we do see um, also large shifts in, in free energies, except for one again. Uh, but mostly uh, we see the expected behavior. So uh, here we have a, a prediction of what we would expect to be um, a destabilization of the complex because you know the complex partner would require ubiquitin in a particular conformation but we have a mutant that prefers the other um, and then of course it's interesting to test if this also holds experimentally and we did that for um, a couple of these mutants and yeah so for mutations where we expected a small effect so um, uh, green and uh, purple are two different um, simulation results uh, um, and uh, orange is the experiment. Um, so for those two where we expected a small effect or no effect, we basically saw a small or no effect. But for those where we expected or predicted a, um, a destabilization, we also saw one. So in fact, yeah, we have here designed a change in function um, by uh, inducing a conformational shift uh, by, by sort of selected mutations. Yeah, and with that, I would like to um, uh, thank all the people who have contributed. So um, yeah, the, uh, this type of free energy calculations all started with Daniel Seliker, who is now working at Beringer Ingelheim and is currently uh, mostly done by Vitas Capsis, with also um, contributions from uh, Vance and Matteo over time, and uh, more recently also by Yuri Kalak in the group. Yeah, thank you very much.